بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم رمضان مبارك عليكم وعلينا وعلى المسلمين جميعا رمضان مبارك to everyone I want to thank the Sheikh Salam Foundation for this opportunity and Sheikh Maryam and all of the people working here. Uh, time is very limited. I'm not used to speaking without a podium. I feel naked, but this is the TED approach to things. So um, what I wanted to talk about, the idea of extremism, looking at it as an illness, um, and what is the illness, what's the etiology of the illness, and then uh, how is that illness treated? If you look uh, at just living in the world, all of us will get sick. Um, societies get sick, people get sick. And our Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah lam yunzil da'an illa anzala lahu shifa, that God has not sent down any disease because it's, we believe good and evil are creations of God. That he did not send any disease down except that he sent down with it a cure, a healing. He knows it who knows it and is ignorant of it who's ignorant of it. The, the thing about this hadith, which is very interesting, is that the Quran talks in terms of diseases and cures as opposed to problems and solutions. And part of the reason for that is problems and solutions, which is an engineering language, um, the idea that you can suddenly just, once you get the solution, you implement the solution, the problem goes away. When you look at disease and illness, diseases take time to come about because health is the natural condition, but over time through bad eating, uh, if you have a disease which is uh, an ideological disease, over time through indoctrination, the mind gets sick. And so looking at it in terms of disease and illness, he healing is a better way because you understand that the problem, the, the problem that you're looking at, this, this diseased condition is not something that you can simply solve overnight. It will take time because it took time to come about. And very often Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, talks about creeping villainy. That most people don't see villainy when it first emerges. They, 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 it takes time before they recognize it. Once it, it's become palpable. The, um, so I want to look at some of these Really, the, 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 in Arabic, it's khalal, which is, it, it can mean facade, like corruption. It's, it's a, in this case, it's a gaping defect. The gaping defects in the understanding of people that are now what we call extremists, the mutatarrifun. Uh, unfortunately, some are called, call them usuliyun, fundamentalist, which is a problem because usuli is a very high term in the Arabic uh, tradition. But the first major defect is what would be termed, uh, and this is from uh, the great scholar Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, these five akhlal, or these five defects in extremist understanding. But the first one is the minhaj al ijtiza, which is a type of s segmentation. It's a decontextualization of a tradition which is quite vast and holistic by its very nature. If there's a famous story about the blind men that look at the, Indi the elephant and one of them is feeling the trunk and describing the elephant as being like a pillar, another feeling the nose, another feeling the leaf. If you have a segmented uh, view of something and not a holistic view, then you will always uh, have a problem because you'll never be able to see the thing for what it is. You will only see a uh, part of what it is. So, the first major problem that you have is It's engaging the, the revelation because we have the nas is the Quran and the Hadith first and foremost. It's engaging the revelation without understanding the holistic nature of it because the Quran, although it came down piecemeal, is a holistic tradition. Abu Ali, uh, Abu Ali al farisi the great Persian grammarian, Ibn Hisham, mentions in Al-Mughni, that Abu Hisham said that Al Quran kulluhu ka suratan wahida. All of the Quran is like one chapter. In other words, you cannot 
take one part of the Quran. In fact, the Quran says, "Atu'minuna bi ba'd al-kitab wa takfuruna bi ba'd." Do you take believe in part of the book and then you don't believe in other parts of the book? The Quran is a holistic tradition that takes many, many years uh, to master. So, for instance, in Surah Al-Hijr, uh, the, the Prophet is described as being mad uh, by his detractors. In Majnun. The answer or the response to that doesn't come until much later in Surah Al-Qalam. مَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ it didn't come immediately after that. The response came much later because this is the way that the Quran works. It's not a linear book. Uh, it's, it's a very deep book. In fact, the deep structure of the Quran, which has been studied for centuries by scholars, uh, and Al-Qudai is probably one of the greatest commentators on the deep structure of the Quran, is, is actually very profound. Over time, people who have studied the Quran for many, many years uh, begin to see these connections. So when you look at this, for instance, there is a hadith and it's in the Arba'in al Nawawiyah, which is one of the most famous collections of a hadith that many, many Muslims around the world have memorized and, uh, and it's taught in many schools. There is a hadith in that collection, which is a Sahih hadith, um, a sound hadith from the Prophet. Umirtu an uqatir an nas hatta yashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَاءَ فَإِذَا فَعْلُوا ذَلِكَ عَصُمُهُمْ مِنِّي دِمَاءُهُمْ وَأَمْوَارُهُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقَّ الْإِسْلَامِ وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى So this hadith says, I was commanded to fight people until they say لا إله إلا الله and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and they establish prayer and they give zakat and once they do that, then their blood and their wealth are free from me except by the right of Islam. It's, their blood and wealth are protected except by the right of Islam meaning if they kill somebody or something or steal and their reckoning is with God it's not for me to judge them as Muslims their reckoning is with God now this hadith is, is a, a deeply problematic hadith because many of the extremists take this hadith and say here's permission to actually fight other people that disagree with us if you don't say la ilaha illallah the Prophet was commanded to fight you until you say it well Part of the problem with that understanding is that if you look at the word nas, which means people, I was, I was commanded to fight people. Umirtun uqatir an nas. So nas is the word that's used. Manhum an nas. That's the question. Manhum an nas. In the Quran, qad ta'ni al fard al wahid, al ladina qad lahum an nasu, inna al nasa qad jama'u lakum. So this was one man, uh, Nu'im bin Mas'ud al-Ashja'i. Uh, there was a waft from Abd al-Qais and they met Abu Sufyan and then they went. And this man said to the, the, the Sahaba, to the companions, Oh, Abu Sufyan and his group have gathered and they're going to come back and fight you after Uhud. So this was one person and yet the Quran says one because one of Asalib Asal al-Arab, uh, Al-Am wa urida bihi al-Khas that you use a general term, but you mean something very specific by it. And this is something that you learn when you study Balagha and Usul al-Fiqh. So another meaning of people in the Quran, am yahsudun al-nasa ala ma'atahum Allah. Do they envy people? Now people here meant one group of people. In this verse, it, it doesn't mean all people, it just means one group, even though the alif lam is used uh, Another example, So here you have the same word in the Quran used for three different meanings as an individual, a small group, and all of humanity. And this is part of the difficulty of, and this, this is part of the difficulty of understanding our tradition, but also why the Muslims, the, traditionally the scholars demanded that you studied Arabic for years before you were allowed to interpret or speak about the Quran or the Hadith. You had to study Arabic until you mastered uh, Nahu, Sarf, Mantiq, Balagha. Once you learn these tools of learning, rhetoric, which is an extensive study in the Arabic tradition, then you were capable of interpreting the Quran. But even then you had to learn, according to Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, he gives 12 sciences necessary before anybody can comment on the Quran. 
And that's why the Quran, if, if these sciences aren't learned, becomes a dangerous book. So who men al ma'mur bi qital al nas? When the Prophet says Umirtu, this couldn't be something specific to him. That once they, they begin to oppose him on the Arabian Peninsula, he was given permission. Uzina lilladinu qataru bi annuhum ghulimu. Permission was granted for those who were being fought to fight back. And so this was given, the permission was given to the Prophet to do this. And so Imam al juwaini one of the great Usuli scholars, said, Wa amal jihadu fa mawkurun ila al imam. The jihad itself is something specific to the leader of the Muslims. And this would be traditionally the Khalifa, but today this is only relegated to the nation states that the Muslims now live under. And there are many ways that the Muslims can live. The idea, which I'll get to that later. Uh, so part of this problem, you have particular verses, but then you have universal principles. They cannot be in contradistinction. So the universal principle has to be working with the, uh, the particular situation. And this is, this is very important because there is, a, there is a very subtle relationship between the universal and the particular in usul al-fiqh, which is completely lost on these ignorant people. The second uh, problem, defect, the gaping defect, is Now this is technical, but it's very important, because what happens, you have two types, when, when God speaks to people, He speaks in two ways. And this is identified by our Usuri scholars. One of them is called khitab, khitab takrif If you are uh, a, an adult, balagh, then you have a, a responsibility if you're a Muslim to do certain things. Like Allah says, aqimu salah. Now if, if you ask me, is prayer wajib? Hela salah wajibatun. The usuli could say, hela anta are you, are you an adult? Because if you're not an adult, it's not wajiba. This is called the khitab al wada which is the situational discourse. So you have the discourse of obligation, but then you have a situational discourse. Now the discourse of obligation is asking you to do something or commanding you to do something, commanding you not to do something, so amr and nahi, and then ibaha, kulu wa sharabu, wa la tusrifu. Ibaha, you can do it or not do it as you like. So this is called khitab takrif The wada. The khitab al wada which is the situational, is, has asbab, it has its means, it has its condition, shurud, it has its rukhas, its licenses, it has its azaim, its firmness, and then it has its mawana. It has those things that prevent it from being implemented. To give you an example, if the sun passes the 90 degree angle, this is a sabab for dhuhr. In other words, dhuhr, the khitab takrif comes in once the time has come in if you're a male. But if you're a menstruating woman who's an adult, there's a mana, there's a preventative that prevents you from implementing that uh, legal ruling. And this applies to all of the ahkam of Islam. So jihad, for instance, it has asbab, it has its, its reasons, it has its conditions, and it has its preventatives. It has things in which it's not permissible to wage. And then there are rukhas and azaims. And, and this all has to look, if you look, the outward movement is towards the waqa, the reality of the situation. So in any given situation, a Usuri scholar has to look to see, is this ruling applicable? Omar ibn al-Khattab, during the Amr Ramada, he did not implement uh, certain punishments for theft, why? Because he understood that people were in a state of necessity. Necessity permits the impermissible. And so he suspended that punishment. That is not to say that he removed the ruling of God. No, it was his understanding that that ruling did not apply in this situation. And there are many examples of that in our legal tradition. In the hadith of Tirmidhi relates it, and Nasa'i Nu'im ibn Hamad is the narrator, innukum fi zamanin man taraka minkum ushara ma umira bihi halak. You're in a time, if you leave one-tenth of what I have brought, you will be destroyed. There's coming a time, if you fulfill one-tenth, 
you will have salvation. Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya understands this to be related to khitab al wadah that towards the end of time, the latter days, many of the things that were applicable in the earlier time, the conditions are no longer there for its applicability. This is not to suspend the ruling of Sharia, but to understand that the Sharia is wise. And there are times when it's appropriate to apply things and times when it's not appropriate. I'll give you an example. Ibn Humam, one of the greatest of the Hanafi Usuri said, when ignorance is widespread, there should be no application of had punishments. So if you have widespread ignorance, you cannot implement had punishments because people are ignorant and they're acting out of their ignorance. The, the third gaping, gaping defect is فكر ارتباط بين الأوامر والنواهي ومنظومة المصارح والمفاسد. The Usuli scholar always looks at masalih and mafasid. They look at a cost-benefit analysis in any situation. What is the benefit? What is the harm? And, and the, the Dar al Mafsada is always understood to be first and foremost to avoid harm. So, whenever harm is more considerable than the benefit, then it's prohibited. And not acknowledging this is something that's caused great trial and tribulation in the Muslim world. Because Muslims take these legal rulings that have to be understood within the four pillars. And these pillars were identified by our scholars um, these, that all of the sharia, all of the sacred law of Islam is wisdom, it's justice, it's rahma, and it's maslaha. Ibn Qayyim al jawziya says, if it goes from hikmah to abath, it's not from the sharia. If it goes from wisdom to foolishness, it's not sharia. If it goes from justice to oppression, it's not sharia. If it goes from mercy to cruelty, it's not sharia. If it goes to maslaha, to mafsada, to, from benefit to harm, it's not sharia. Let me give you one example. In, in the old books of fiqh, the qisas, when you have qisas, the ulama said that because the Quran says, bihi, that you should punish in the same way that's punished. In some of the texts, they said that if somebody uh, punishes by fire, they should be punished by fire. So if somebody murders somebody by fire, they should be, so, uh, this is what uh, Sidi Khalil says, that if somebody uh, kills somebody else, they should be killed with the same means. This is what they call the lex talionis in, 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 in the tradition, the eye, the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, retribution. Scholars never implemented that because there's a hadith in Al-Bukhari that says, Nobody should kill with fire except the people, uh, except the Lord of fire. So nobody should punish another person with fire except the Lord of fire. So the ulama didn't implement this, even though it's mentioned in the books. So ignorant people come and they see this in the books and they say, oh, well, this, this is how sharia should be implemented. So the, the, uh, this, just a, a few examples. Sayyidina Omar, the Quran says, حَتَّى يُعْطُوا الْجِزْيَةَ عَنْ يَدٍ وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ That they should pay jizya from their own hand uh, in a humbled state. So jizya was part of the Islamic uh, sharia. So people, minority communities paid this thing called jizya, which is a, a tax. It's a protective tax. It, you enter into a status of called dhimmatud, the dhimmiyun. Dhimma means protected, fi dhimmati. The Arabs still say this, huwafi dhimmati, it's in, it's, I'm responsible for him. So this was an idea. Now, Omar accepted sadaqa instead of jizya from the Arab Christians and from the Jews of Himyar. Why? Because they didn't want to pay jizya. And Omar was fine because it was their thaqafa, it was their culture that they felt that it was undignified for them as Arab Christians or as Jews from the Yemeni tribes to pay jizya. And so he took from them sadaqa. Even though the Nasr Quran is this, because Omar understood that there was greater benefit in that. Now, if you look, jizya, according to Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, is only one of the possibilities in the Sharia. He identifies four in the history of Islam. The first is, umirtu an uqatir an nas. This came for the mushrikeen of the Arabs that were fighting to eliminate the Muslims. This came for the Byzantine uh, Empire. 
But This is a general principle that's never been abrogated. If people incline towards peace, you can enter into a peace like we today we have international treaties between people. And the fourth one, which he considers the most appropriate for the current environment, is the Sahifatul Medina, which is where the Prophet ﷺ gave full enfranchisement to the minority communities of Medina. And Imam al-Shafi'i says, I know of no one that differs in Lam a'lam mukhalifan min ahl al-ilm bi seer anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lamma nazar bin Medinati wada al-Yahud kafatan ala ghiri jizya. He made a treaty with them without jizya. Now there will be some who say, well that abrogated, that was abrogated by the verses in Tawbah. But these aren't abrogated. So this has been a neglected aspect of our tradition. So this aspect has unfortunately not been studied as it should be appropriately studied. It's interesting that there's a Western scholar who's written a book recently on this subject. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, No building of worship was destroyed. And the Prophet actually, He prohibited to destroy buildings uh, uh, in war. It's one of the prohibitions in war. The fourth uh, problem here is, is not understanding the contextualization of jihad. So if you look, for instance, in the earlier period, the, 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 the concept of jihad, it, it, it arose in a situation where there were no treaties. The, the Arabs used to say, If you don't fight Rome, Rome will fight you. This was the environment of the pre-modern world. If you look at the pre-modern, uh, all of the pre-modern borders, you will see that they're borders that were fought for. People fought. And so the Byzantines were attacking the Muslims, the Muslims were attacking the Byzantines. This was the world. Even at the early period, the Arabs were a group of tribes. Many of these tribes lived off attacking other tribes. And they actually had conditions in which they fought. And for, for instance, they wouldn't uh, take the harim generally, the women, because it would cause a whole cycle of violence. But they could steal goats, and then they would steal their goats or camels, and then the other tribe, when they got their opportunity, they would go steal their goats and camels. This was the environment that the Arabian Peninsula Arabs were living in. There was a lot of starvation and other problems. This has to be understood when you read the verses of Jihad. Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya said that in the early period of Islam, there was a khilaf about Jihad al-Talab and Jihad al-Difa about whether there was preemptive jihad or only defensive jihad. Ibn Taymiyyah was of the opinion that jihad was only defensive, and he argued that anybody that studies the seerah deeply will see that the Prophet ﷺ only fought defensively. Now what's interesting about this, he says today this debate should be over. That jihad should be understood to be the right which the United Nations gives every nation to defend themselves against an invading or occupying force. And, and the idea of going out in an age of nuclear weapons, in an age of aerial bombardment, and attacking other people is insanity. <laughs> These people literally should be declared insane because they're bringing so much harm on people by doing this. So, The other is, the, so if you look, Ayatul Jihad wa Ahadithu Ayatul Saif, Yartabitu Kullun Minha bi Siyaqin Khasin Jiddan. Each one, now Zarka, Imam Zarkashi, one of the great Usuli scholars said, Kullu Amran Warada Yejibim Titharahu fi Waqtin Ma. Everything that comes down will find its appropriate time and place. Li illatin tijibu dharik al hukum, because of some legal rationale for the, the, the ruling or the category. Thumma yantakil bin tiqari tirk al illati ila hukman akhar. And then when the, the rationale changes, it, the category or the ruling will change. This is the depth of our tradition, and this is why Islamic law is much closer to constitutional law than it is to statute law. And unfortunately, many Muslims see it as statute laws. They don't understand that these laws have asbab, shurut, mawani' that every ruling in Islam has reasons, it has conditions, and it has 
prohibitions or preventatives when it's not used. And finally, and I, I, my time's out, so I'll finish this. Al-Khalal al-Khamis, al-Tasawwar al-Tarikhi al-Sathi. This superficial understanding of history, which so many of the Muslims romanticize history. One of the interesting things about the Muslim world is you have no, no Muslims will watch Star Trek. It's, you cannot get this kind of science fiction because Muslims, they're not interested in the future. We have a romanticized view of the past. We want to return to the past. There's this nostalgia about the past, and yet very often it is completely fantastic. It's an emotional view of the past that never existed in reality. The idea that somebody like Salahuddin al Ayyubi will just emerge and come as a savior and remove all the hardships and tribulations from the Muslims. If you study the life of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, he was involved in a very complex, uh, situation and so this is one of the major problems that we have in the Muslims do not recognize that Muslim civilization like the human life also has seasons it has growth it has uh, strength and then it has decay decrepitude and it dies and this is simply a fact and you cannot restore what is dead and and again this is a major problem so if you look at Abdul Malik bin Marwan he actually paid the Romans at the height of Muslim civilization. He paid the Romans to guard the borders. So he was paying money to the Romans. Salahuddin al Ayyubi fought with Christians against Muslims. Amir Abdul Qadr al Jazairi, the great Algerian Mujahid, at times allied with the Christians against Muslims. Because these people were pragmatists and they understood that life is compromised. The Prophet never compromised his principles, but he did compromise. And Hudaybiyah is one of the great examples of that. So another thing is that a lot of these Muslim extremists don't understand that the nation state is an acceptable form of governance. The fact that we now exist in nation states because to remove these nation states would create more mafsada min maslaha. You would actually create more terror, more harm than benefit. And so this is part, they, they still are thinking in terms of empires of the past. And finally, in conclusion, our Prophet ﷺ said, يَحْمِرُ هَذَا الْعِلْمِ مِنْ كُلِّ خَلَفٍ عُدُولُهُ That this knowledge will be carried in every generation by upright people. يَنْفُونَ عَنْهُ تَحْرِيفَ الْغَالِينَ The distortions of extremists. إِنْتِحَالِ الْمُطِّلِينَ The decontextualizations of nullifiers. وَالتَّأْوِيلَ الْجَاهِلِينَ If we take these three, we have to address rectifying this segmented understanding of Islam. We also have to refute those people that attempt to nullify the, the beauty and, the, and, the, and the, the mercy of Islam by only pointing out certain decontextualized verses and not pointing out others. And then elevating the general culture and understanding of our Muslim community, which has fallen on hard times. We have a lot of illiteracy. We have poor education. And these things have to be addressed. And finally, a lot of this can be done. I, I'm out of time, so I'll leave it for the thing. But one of the things that, and I hope the, the, the Emirates thinks about this, is that the criminalization of anathematization, of, of declaring other people disbelievers or outside of Islam. The Prophet said that to call a Muslim a kafir is like killing him. Because there are people that will actually take it as a permissibility to kill them. And as somebody who was declared a murtad, and, and, and asked for their blood to be shed, I can honestly say I understand the wisdom behind this. So it's, it's something that, uh, that we as, as Muslims need to think deeply about, about this ideology of takfir, of accusing other people of being outside of Islam uh, and, 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 and not being part of this ummah. Because this group, unfortunately, the, the, these extremists, they view themselves as representing the ummah and only them, and everybody else is astray. The, prophet, the, the Quran says, وَلَا تَقُولُ لِمَنْ أَلْقَى إِلَيْكُمْ السَّلَامُ لَسْتَ مُؤْمِنًا Don't say to anybody that gives you peace, you're not a believer. أَقُولُ قَوْرِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ شُكْرًا سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ